Let's see what Green Day sold. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your Daily Dose guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. That's right, the world-famous Green Day band just recently put over 100 items back into their reverb shop, so let's check them out. Starting with this very interesting Gretsch from the Back in the USA music video. Which, if you're not familiar with it, yeah, you can see it right here by his TV. And then you can just briefly see it at the end in color. In fact, I would have never imagined it would have looked anything like this. So we've got the Streamliner Electromatic, double cutaway to pick up Bigsby vibe, but it looks like this thing was set on fire. Like maybe it started life as a bluish burst and then it got spray painted and burnt up. <laughs> Sure, this thing definitely has a story to share because when you get to the back it's almost perfect it's a nice turquoise blue color the headstock got a matching treatment there's no longer a gretch logo on it and this is how you can definitely tell it was set on fire miraculously enough we still have our serial number on the back they listed and sold that one for four grand but speaking of music videos green day just came out with a new single where he's seen playing a very interesting les paul studio the neck looks studio but the body looks les paul custom I had a viewer of the show reach out asking me if I knew anything about this. I don't, but maybe that will be the next signature model. And I say that might be a new signature model because he did sell a white Les Paul Studio in this sale. And it has the sentence, Billy is a big fan of Les Paul Studio models and owns many. So let's check out this one that went for two grand. The story of this one is he played it in his cover band, The Cover Ups. Generally, these ebony fretboarded white studios sell anywhere between a thousand and like eighteen hundred on a really good day. So that's not too bad of a pre premium if you happen to like Green Day. This one doesn't even appear to be in that bad a shape, it just got a little bit of nicks and dings on the corner. You got the cool Stormtrooper vibes going on with our chrome hardware, a little bit of stand rash on the back, headstock's looking alright. Can't quite see it but it looks like that might be a 2001 model. And of course we've got some finished checking too, with a gig bag. Here was a big hitter, the Black American Flag, that sold for $12,000. So apparently the story on this one is it was custom painted by Gibson for the Revolution Radio Tour and subsequently played all around the world. So what's cool about Gibson doing the paint job is it truly is a one-off for the artist. Now whether or not it's a prototype or not is up to debate, but it looks like it was a 2006 model based on his original run of Signature Juniors. Interesting to see the kind of custom looking flames on the side whereas the back was just left alone. Very interesting that he had a brass nut put on it and a Les Paul custom truss rod cover. And for some reason, we've got two giant dots on the side of the neck. And now you might be saying, hey, well, that's how he sees in the dark stage. Well, not all of them were enlarged. And we've got a nice 90s era case. If that one was a little bit too rich for your blood, if you were quick enough, you could have got this regular Les Paul Jr. at three and a half. Now, this one does not appear to be a signature model. It was just an off-the-shelf Jr. that saw some playtime in rehearsals and was repainted white by Billy's Guitar Tech. Judging by our serial number, it was from 2012. It's possible it started life something like this. Then I was kind of excited to see he had one of these. One of the Les Paul DC tributes. These were such a great value when they were offered brand new. And this was the upgraded 2 pickup version. It just seemed like a guitar that he would be interested in based on his love of juniors and specials. But these were top routed guitars and they had the maple necks. This one happens to have a little bit of flame figuring within it. Brand new, these range from 700 to 1000, but then they got discontinued and they've actually held and increased in value since then. This one doesn't appear to have been played too much, but at least it has an interesting story that you only had to pay like a double premium for. But I had to do a double take on this one. Did I sell Billy Joe a guitar? So this is a Gibson Sonics, but instantly I went to the headstock and was like, oh, Sonics by Gibson, you don't see that too often. In the Sonics history, you can check out this episode to learn more, there were a few different brandings. And during one of the Trey Tuesday seasons, I actually came across one of these that had the whole Sonics by Gibson logo. And there were not many of them made in that variation. So that's why I had to do the double take. Is this the same guitar? So I checked the serial number, 81522. Note the ding right here. And now note the ding over here. Nope, not the same. <laughs> At least it gives us a little bit of a serial number range in which that logo might have existed. But I sold that last non-famous one for about a thousand bucks. That was a pretty fair deal. Although they're very nicely saying right here, it's not a very good guitar. To be fair, if you go into a Gibson Sonics thinking it's going to be a regular Les Paul standard like performance, you're gonna have a bad time. If you go into it with managed expectations, you might enjoy it. Then they listed a skinny headstock Les Paul Jr. modded and owned by him. This thing's kind of interesting. We've got dual dog ear P90 covers on it. However, this one doesn't appear to have a pickup there. 
Whereas this one does, it initially started life with a humbucker, so you can see the additional route right there, as well as the holes where the pit guard ring would be. It's got a standard wrap tail, he's capped off some things, it has a very standard layout of a master volume most likely, maybe a kill switch or something there. Then you flip over to the back, you get the Gibson USA heel carve, and it's a straight up maple neck from 2017, so that means this was part of Gibson's M series. You know what the Firebird Zero was part of. Likely started life as one of these, and he just modified it from humbuckers to a slightly more junior-esque layout. Another one of those guitars that you have to go into it with managed expectations for a fighting chance of loving it. But I thought this one was very appropriately priced. 3500 bucks. Labeled as a Tomato Soup BGA prototype, pick guard test mule. Never mentions anything about being played by him. It's just more so him and or his tech playing around to see what's going on here. Because it's this model right here that it eventually became. It had that weird double cut junior special pick guard that had been modified just to have a humbucker. It was kind of a hot topic back in 2018. But at the end of the day, I'm just glad it was different from the initial run. Might not have been as good in my opinion, but it's still part of the BJA history. And he's had a ton of signature guitars. And there was actually one more. This one was free. You just had to be the lucky winner. So you had to sign up to be notified about all this. Which, by the way, Reverb, I did sign up, but I was never notified. So I kind of missed out on the drop of all these things. But you had to have done that by the 18th. And then if you go through these rules, basically they say within 30 days, they should know who the winner was. And if you want to know who won, you have to email their legal team within 60 days. But this thing was pretty cool. It's basically another 2018 prototype that appears to have seen some use. They were clearly playing around with the pickups as well as our pick guard. That was an exciting one. Speaking of the main 2018 run, here's one that he played on tour that he modified a little bit with his initials. So far, I would say this is probably one of the more exciting ones for collectors because if you're going to have one of these, you might as well have one that the artist used a bit to have some more provenance with it. I mean, for being played by him, it, it honestly doesn't appear to be in that bad a shape. But it looks like you might need to replace your nut if you want to gig it more and it has a replaced case. But it went for five grand, which is about double what you would normally pay for one. But now we get to move on to the less of the norm guitars. So there's a 335, looks like a 70s model. Easiest way to instantly tell those is they typically have this coil split switch. Looks like another toggle. And we've got our trapeze set up. And judging by our serial number, it is from 1979. Doesn't seem to have been played too incredibly much. Nice dark walnut color. Looks like maybe a different tailpiece had been on it at one point in time. Potentially even swapped pickups, because generally you would find the Dirty Fingers pickups in this era. That's why they have the coil splits. But this one lived in his Oakland studio. That one definitely saw a bit of a premium. There was an interesting Fender Bullet that went for two grand. Which again is like a two times premium as far as I understand from the last time I looked at the market for these things. I love these old bullet guitars. They're great. Again, if you go into them with managed expectations. But I remember really liking this S3 in this review and demo. But it looks like this one has been upgraded with a Seymour Duncan pickup in the bridge. And it's got a nice white color. Then he had a pretty cool ES275. This one was from 2018. We documented one of these out of the demo shop a couple of years ago. I really like this model, and he seems to like his P90 pickup, so I don't see why he wouldn't enjoy this. Got a nice vintage sunburst color. And made in the old Memphis plant. And to follow that up, he also had one of these. So occasionally, they make 335s with P90s. Even though if we really want to get technical, you're starting to just make it seem like a casino that has a center block or an ES330. But it's got all your regular stuff, bridge tailpiece. It almost appears to have a satin back and sides. The neck is ultra swooped right here. That might just be the lighting angle. But yet the top is gloss. And it's a nice dark walnut color. I would almost say this might have been some sort of a prototype or a small run that I'm not familiar with. Kind of has a strange HB073M branding to it. And the description can confirm it was custom made for him. And the rest of the description confirms what I saw. That went for 55. I think that was fair. Check this out, a Bernie. So this is like one of those old lawsuit era guitars. One of the good ones. Not only does it look cosmetically impressive, but it has the good construction. As far as what I've heard, like it's not a bolt-on neck. It's got all the gold hardware. It's got the ebony fretboard. The inlays are looking okay. I mean, this one definitely has a nice Randy Rhodes-like vibe to it. Just need a brass poker chip. I have not actually tried one of these yet, but it's in the case labeled as long shot and went for two grand. But I was shocked to see one of these, a nice fancy boy double cut. I think Gibson introduced these around 2018-ish. It has a flame maple cap on it, which is cool, but yet it's still a flat top. And it's got the binding everywhere, body and neck. You've got the ABR1 bridge upgrade. 
Apparently the story of this one is it was posted to Instagram by Gibson, and then he called him up and said, hey, I like that, please. <laughs> And then he used it in his studio. One of those is like three to four thousand, so paying five grand for that, if you're a fan of his, not bad at all. He also had a custom shop DC Jr. Apparently this one was just a backup guitar that traveled around with him that didn't see a lot of playtime, unless something went wrong. But oof, strap button moved here and over there, before settling on there. That went for 55. This one was pretty cool, a NAMM show 2018 guitar. However, Gibson didn't go to the NAMM show in 2018, so I wonder if it was that consumer electronics one that they showed some stuff at. So let's see if we can find it. Got a couple of modern flying Vs. Looks like maybe some Kramers in the back, an acoustic. Surprised to see a Scotty Moore ES295 there. And that's probably one of the Alex Lifeson signatures. I'm not seeing it along this wall of semi-hollows, but it looks like they just had their normal NAM booth, just not at the normal show that it usually is. So maybe a bit more to the tail there, but let's go ahead and look at this thing. If you wonder why it's called Diamond, because of the holes right there, but oh, I did not notice it had the black sparkle finish on top of it. Nice aged nickel hardware, no matching headstock, but I can see why he liked that. It's kind of like the old charcoal metallic finish. Very cool. Apparently that's another one he called up his rep and said, hey, I want that. Then there was this interesting Burns bass guitar that he used in his studio. Definitely has a homely vibe to it, but a little bit of a telly neck, like mixed with a Tysco body or something. <laughs> I like it, it's quirky. And this next one is a machine gun guitar, but what I found funnier than this is Reverb suggests, did you mean the machine gun Kelly signature guitar? <laughs> I'm sure he just bought that for fun, which seems to back up what they're saying here. And lastly, a vintage B25 acoustic. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed learning about the guitars that the Green Day band just recently sold. Which one was your favorite? Let me know in the comments, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.